Where are you from? They ask. I, I live in Amsterdam, I say, and they respond. No, 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 no. You know, I mean, like, like, where are you, like, really, really, really from? The Netherlands, I reply. To which they sigh and say, <sighs> what I meant was, where are your parents from? And there we are, stuck in a place without space to let truth in. Wrapped around with chains of thought brought to you by years of ignorance is bliss. And at this point, I'd rather walk away. Because I know what they want me to say, it's just that I can't answer a question loaded with a refusal to explore fired. With a shoot to kill mentality. You see, we all have skin. But the thing with skin is, it doesn't define who we are. And mine is telling you that I'm ch 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 Asian. <laughs> and yours is saying white. But we are more than just the label that someone once gave us. Our story is a complex combination of twists and turns, more than lists of facts. And the fact is that mine began back then when, on a stormy November day high up in the sky, my sister and I, on our way to a new life, a new family. You see, we, we were adopted. As our parents opted for a different future. And it took a Dutch family to take us in, giving us a break from uncertainty, redirecting our future towards a better living. Exchanging parents for parents. Going from Confucius to Montessori, a different story of neither here nor there, always in between somewhere where contradictions meet as if I were a traffic controller standing in the middle of an intersection, guiding misguided beliefs in the right direction. But every once in a while, even traffic lights can't prevent accidents from happening. Some beliefs won't slow down and yours, well, yours has been accelerating for the better part of your life up to the point where one can only hope for minimum collateral damage upon the impact of you crashing into me. You see, if you really want to know who I am, you gotta see past my skin. Because I am more than the skin I'm in. Behind these tiny eyes is a wide range of experiences, experiences that shape my identity far beyond my nationality, experiences that will tell you everything you need to know about who I am and who I ain't. And I can tell you right now, I am not who you think I am. I'm not Asian. I'm not Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Dutch, European. You can't simplify a human being to a clothing label telling you what they're made of. You can't wear their identity like a comfortable sweater, and I am warning you, I don't wear comfortably. You can ask me anything you want, but if you can't accept me for who I am, then damn your questions and damn you. If you can't listen to my truth, then take a step back and reflect on yourself. If you ask me, without the curiosity to explore an answer that doesn't fit your assumptions and conclusions about me, then I see no reason to reason with you. I am not a goddamn stereotype existing solely to reinforce your skewed bias and yes, sometimes, racist perceptions of a world reinforced by society that can't tell the difference between Muslims and terrorists, where white is defined as superior and black pride considered dangerous. Where all Asians are Chinese and seen as asexual nerds, so please know that when you ask me, where are you from? You're not asking me a simple question. You're questioning my existence in your privileged world. When you ask me, where are you really, really, really from? You're not looking to acknowledge me. You're asking me to acknowledge you. And when you ask me, but where are your parents from? What you're really asking me to do is to give up my identity at the expense of you not having to question yours because yours is an identity carefully built upon the belief that the world is white despite the fact that most isn't. Baptized in white privilege, allowing you to live ignorantly in denial while I and many others like me have to fight every fucking day to get the same acknowledgement for who we are. So, are you really, 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 really sure you want to know who I am? 
because I am a confusion of cultures, uniquely me. And it's time for you to see that if you really want to know who I am, then don't ask me where I am from. Just ask me. So, I'm a behavioral change enthusiast and a spoken word artist. And I guess what that means is that during the day, I get paid to fix people's problems. And in the evening, I get paid to talk about my problems. <laughs> now, there is some truth to it as a spoken word artist. In the evenings, you get paid with, uh, usually with free beers. Um, since I don't drink alcohol, usually it's water. Um, but during the day, I do get paid um, to watch people, to observe people and to help organizations change the behaviors of their employees. Um, and it's an interesting experience. Uh, so I get paid to basically watch people, slap them in the face, tell them that you're doing that wrong, <laughs> change your behavior. Um, now, inclusive, inclusiveness is a subject that time and time again pops up. And it's a very wide topic. And as a person of color, a POC, it may be more obvious for me to talk about racism today. I don't want to talk about racism uh, as a main subject. Um, I want to talk about an underlying problem uh, that all of us are um, guilty of when it comes to the subject of inclusive. So we are going to get a bit uncomfortable. We're going to face some hard truths about being human. We're going to laugh, hopefully. And at the end of it, I hope that we all leave a little bit wiser. Now, um, if you think that this is going to be one of those talks where you can just sit and process. Um, you're in for a treat. <laughs> because we are going to start with a quiz. Yeah, we are going to start with a quiz. Uh, it's not a quiz about, don't worry, it's not a quiz about race or gender or, or inclusive diversity. It is a quiz about very random things. And um, uh, you need to write down the answer. So either write it down on a piece of paper and a, uh, with a pen or take your phone out and digital digitally record your answers. Now, this is like one of those quizzes or, you know, like elementary school. This is individual. You got to protect your answers with your life. No cheating. <laughs> no collaboration. This is an individual quiz. We're going to test your knowledge. Uh, one thing about the answers, they're always numbers. So I'm going to ask you ten, 10 questions and the answer is always a number. More specifically, it's a range. So your answer is always a range, two numbers, a range, yeah? So one to 10. And all you need to do, all you need to make sure is that you're 90, 90, 90% confident that the right answer to the question falls within the range that you write down. So let's start. Question number one. According to the to China State Administration of Cultural Relics, what is the entire length of the Chinese wall, including all its branches in kilometers. So, according to China State Administration Cultural Relics, what is the entire length of the Chinese wall, including all its branches, in kilometers? Five, four, three, two, one. You should have written down two numbers, a range in which the right answer falls. Question number two. According to the United Nations, what is the total number of African countries? According to the United Nations, what is the total number of African countries? Five, four, three, two, one. Question number three. Booking.com, uh, a company from the Netherlands, headquarters here in Amsterdam, uh, very successful. Um, according to their website, checked it yesterday. According to them, how many reported listings are on Booking.com? How many reported listings are on the website of Booking.com? Five, four, three, two, one. Question number four. Um, what is Mozart's, uh, uh, Mozart's lifespan from birth year to his year of death? Birth year to year of death of Mozart. Five, four, three, two, one. Question number five. Dutch people love cycling, so I've got to have a question about cycling. According to the Fietsersbond, <laughs> cycling union, uh, 
In kilometers, what is the total, num uh, total length of cycling roads in the Netherlands? In kilometers, what is the total length of cycling roads in the Netherlands? Five, four, three, two, one. Question number six. Um, we're going to move to Australia. Uh, according to the Meat and Livestock Australia uh, in 2016, what was the total number of sheep in Australia? <laughs> total number of sheep in Australia, 2016, according to Meat and Livestock. Five, four, three, two, one. Question number seven. In the entire history of Nobel Prizes, 1901, 1901 until 2018, how many times was an, a Nobel Prize awarded to a woman? Five, four, three, two, one. Question number eight. Um, talk about religion. According to the 2017 Anuario Pontificio by the um, Catholic Church, what is the total global population of Catholic? Catholics. The total population of Catholics according to the Catholic Church. Five, four, three, two, one. Question number nine, uh, coffee. Let's talk about coffee, that black gold that so many of us need in the morning to get started. Uh, Starbucks, uh, arguably you can argue whether it's good coffee, but they are successful. So according to Starbucks website, what are the total number of stores worldwide? The total number of Starbucks stores worldwide? Five, four, three, two, one. And the last question, question number 10. Um, Dutch population grows. The Dutch population is growing. And so with how many people per day is the Dutch population growing currently on average? So how many people per day is the Dutch population growing right now on average? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, good. Now, you've got your answers locked. If you've done this correctly, because you needed to be 90% confident that the right answer falls within your range. You should have nine correct answers. Let's find out. Question number one. The total length of the Chinese wall, according to the uh, China State Administration of Cultural Relics, is 21,196 kilometers. Okay, some people are losing their uh, buffer right now. Um, <laughs> question number two. Total number of African countries, according to United Nations, 54. 54. <laughs> it's always more than most people think it's less. Uh, question number three. The total number of reported listings on Booking.com is 28,504,862. 28,000,000. digit, uh, If you don't have eight digits... Um, yes. Mozart's lifespan started from 1756 to 1791. Number of cycling roads in kilometers, the total length of cycling roads in kilometers is 35,000. Mm. Question number six, number of sheep in Australia, 67,500,000. <laughs> Question number seven, the total times, total ti total times uh, an award, a Nobel Prize was awarded to a woman in over 100 years, 52. Yeah, that's shockingly low. I had 20. <laughs> Global Catholic population, according to the church, is 1 billion, 280 million. 1 billion, 280 million. Okay, question number nine. The total number of Starbucks stores worldwide, 22,519. 22,519. And last question. Uh, with how many people per day is the, on average, is the Dutch population growing right now? It's 255 wow. people per day. Wow. Damn, yeah. Now, let me just check. Anyone who got 10, 9 or 10 correct answers? Okay, uh, 8, 7, 6, 6. Yes. And, and, and I'll spare you the embarrassment, we won't go any lower. Now, Interestingly, now this, what this elaborate quiz demonstrated is a fundamental problem, one of the many, but a fundamental problem underlying the subject of inclusiveness. And we do it all the time. All of us do it. All of us are subject to it. And the problem that we face, one of the many, and I, what I want to do is I want to zoom in on only one problem, because we only have so much time, so little time actually. 
So I want to zoom in on one problem and then talk about three steps, sequential steps that you can take to challenge that problem. And the problem that this elaborate quiz just showed is assumed expertise. The un fundamental problem to um, creating more inclusive environments is that all of us, including myself, are subject to assumed expertise. We assume expertise on way too many subjects that we truly are absolutely ignorant about. Anyone here an expert on uh, sheep population in Australia? <laughs> no. And yet, when you wrote down the range, you were thinking, yeah, I'm pretty sure it must be within these two numbers. And yet, if I would ask you, do you know anything about sheep in Australia? <laughs> Probably the answer is not really. So why didn't you take a bigger range? Because I was confident that I knew. Assumed expertise. Now, the question about Starbucks stores, total length of cycling roads in the Netherlands, are perhaps innocent questions. When we talk about diversity, inclusion, when we go into subjects of racism, sexism, rape culture, and other isms. Assumed expertise is very dangerous. Now, in Dutch, we have the saying, we have 17 million national football coaches. <laughs> Goes back to this. The day after football match, everyone always knows better. Why is this a problem? Why, do, why are we subject to this? Why do we assume expertise on so many uh, topics? One, simply arrogance. And that is perhaps a hard truth. A certain level of arrogance, overestimation of how capable we really are. One is ignorance. And ignorance is nothing more than a lack of knowledge. Ignorance is not an insult. Ignorance literally <coughs> means a lack of knowledge. And on most subjects in life, we are ignorant. We just don't like to admit it. Um, unaware is another problem that creates that assumed expertise. Unaware. So this talk on the theme of inclusive is not very inclusive. Why is that? Any ideas? We cannot include enough topics to talk about inclusion. That, that could be, yeah, <laughs> yes. Time. Other ideas? Why is this talk not inclusive? <coughs> Because it's just me talking, yeah. <laughs> I could talk about this for, for days. True. Now, who are not capable of attending this talk? All the people that live here. The people who don't live here. People what are people that have to work? People with accessibility problems, like blind and deaf. Or blind, blind and deaf. <laughs> yeah. A deaf person could be here, but if we don't have a translator. A deaf person would have a lot of difficulty taking on the information. At what point did you become aware that ableism is an issue here, right here in this room? At what point did you become aware of it? Now. No. <laughs> right now. Unaware is a problem connected to assumed expertise. We already think we know but there's so much that we don't that we're not even aware of. Mm -hmm. So how can we even tackle the topic of inclusiveness if we're not even aware how exclusive we are? Um, for people in, in the wheelchair, it's also a little bit more difficult to get here. Uh, not because of the ramp over there, but because the toilets are not very accessible. But when we sign up for this talk, we don't think about toilets because <laughs> we know we can access the toilets. For us, it's not a problem. We don't think about a ramp because when we sign up for this talk, we know it's going to be inclusive for us. So arrogance, ignorance, as well as unaware, simply a lack of awareness, um, leads to assumed expertise. And the other thing is false empathy. False empathy uh, relates to um, the idea that I want to help you. And I'm assuming that I know how to help you. So have you ever had a bad day? and you came home to your partner or to your parents or a good friend and you started sort of just complaining. Ah, I had a shitty day, my boss, blah, blah, blah. And, and your friend or your partner was like, well, have you tried this? <laughs> That's laughter of recognition. 
Um, did it make you feel better? No. no. Why not? <laughs> yeah. What is it that you wanted? Be listened to. <laughs> Listen to. Now, question, honestly. Are you sometimes giving unsolicited advice? <laughs> All the time! <laughs> it's human! But in giving unsolicited advice, we assume a couple of things. We assume that we know better. We assume that our solution is the right solution. We assume that the other person needs our solution. We assume that the other person can't fix it without our help. Assumed expertise. It happens so quickly. So, let's talk about three steps that we can take to challenge this idea of assumed expertise. Because it happens at work as well. Strategy, at work, conversations. Everyone always knows. No one really says, I don't. Now, um, I was adopted, together with my sister. My sister and I were born in South Korea. We were adopted by a Dutch family, um, as Dutch as you can get. Um, I grew up in a, on a farm uh, in Drenthe. I can pop rotten for the Dutch people. I can speak with a farmer's accent. People usually don't expect that. Now, um, our parents, consciously chose to adopt us. It was a conscious decision. They could have their own uh, children of their own. Biologically, they decided, we want to help um, children who need adoption to have a future. And so you'd kind of assume, if they made a conscious decision, uh, they probably also were very aware that they're white, and my sister and I are um, generally Asian. Um, when I was about 15 years old, we started having the first conversations about plastic surgery. I had a deep desire to get plastic surgery. Uh, I wanted to get my um, eyes corrected, because that's what it's called, eyelid correction. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get my nose changed. I wanted to be taller, because I grew up in the Netherlands, the country of giants. <laughs> and we had those conversations for over a year. We had those conversations on and off. And my parents were always very supportive. They said, if you really want this, um, we're gonna look into how to do that. Now, um, spoiler alert, I didn't get my eyelid <laughs> corrected. <laughs> but one of the topics we never talked about in that conversation about plastic surgery and my desire to be white is race. We never talked about really about racism, we never talked about white supremacy, we never talked about privilege, we never talked about unconscious bias. And that's kind of weird, isn't it? Now, my parents and I never really spoke in depth about race, even though race was, was a subject that is still an issue for me today. Last year, in 2018, I decided it's enough. We need to start talking about race. We have to. Um, or at least I want to. Um, didn't go so well. <laughs> um, with my dad, it went really well. With my mom, it didn't go so well. And ever since last year, we've been having a lot of conflicts uh, when we talk about race. And the difference between my mom and my dad is my dad sits there and listens. My mom assumes that she knows and understands. And she starts arguing. And she starts talking about sexism and other isms, not about race. And. Um, I think one of the solutions, and that is what my dad showed me, and what I see in my work around behavioral changes, one of the ways to solve this assumed expertise is to acknowledge your ignorance. Literally learn the sentence, I don't know, I'm unaware, I am ignorant about this, I am not educated about this. Just learn those sentences and start applying them, because it invites the other person to share more, to talk more. And <laughs> This is important too, continuously educate yourself. If you don't know where to start, over there on those tables, a lot of books where you can start. It's just a starting point. Education never stops. But what I believe is even more important is that first step. Acknowledge your ignorance. Just take it. And a lot of weight will go off your shoulders because the moment you say, I don't know, you don't have a need to defend yourself in your expertise. The other thing that my dad does Especially this. He listens, <coughs> listens, and listens. And he asks curious questions. 
And I think we need to nurture our curiosity. How do we do that? By asking better questions. Not like when we talk about race, the question isn't, but what about sexism? When we talk about sexism, the question isn't, but what about ableism? The right kind of questions is, perhaps things like, um, what is your experience with that? What does it affect you? How does it affect you? Um, how would you like me to engage with you? And that is what my dad does. He has that curiosity, and he, he told me that he has to be very uh, aware of it when we have those conversations, because he, he also notices sometimes that he gets defensive and agitated. My mom argues. She argues with me about race. That's not racism, that's not racism, that's not racism. What happened in January this year is um, I was going to perform spoken word in Zwolle and I invited my parents to come as well because they live in Drenthe, Zwolle, not too far away. And um, we met for lunch uh, first and we started talking about depression and we started talking about race because uh, it was related to some, some of the poems that I wanted to perform. And what happened the conversation got very intense. And at some point, my mom stood up and said something along the lines, I don't remember the exact words. Like, uh, uh, I can never be enough. I can never do you good. And she stormed out of the cafe. My dad stayed, and we continued talking. And we continued talking about the situation that happened. In that conversation, he addressed this and the difference between him and my mom. He also mentioned something else. He said, with what he knows today, if he would have to do it again, adopting, he would probably adopt white children. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that's a good thing. I think it was just the most honest thing he could say. Some self-revelation. Knowing what I know today, I would not adopt children of color. And we continue talking about that, and I learned more about my dad. The other thing that happened, which is the reason why my mom stormed out of the cafeteria, is I said something to her that really hurt her, and I didn't know that it hurt her. And it relates to the third step. So it's, it's a sequential step. You acknowledge your ignorance, and you become curious. You nurture your curiosity, so you start learning more. And then the third step is you challenge your privilege and behaviors, and you admit guilt. And we will never be able to have a good conversation about inclusiveness if we're not willing to explore guilt. Here's what I said that made my mom so upset. I said, if you would have read more about racism, this conversation would be a lot easier. What I didn't know is that my mom is dyslexic her entire life. And that comment for me, if you would have read more, this conversation would be easier, really upset her because it triggered all the, all the reflection that she has had about all the dreams that she believes she had to give up because she couldn't read. Because my dad still has to read her emails sometimes because she can't. We didn't speak for three months. This was the first week of January. We didn't speak for three months. And after three months, I picked up the phone, I called my mom, I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for hurting you. I'm sorry for what I said that hurt you so much. And she said, next time you're home or next time we're together, we should talk more and really start to understand each other better. Is it true that if she would have read more, that the conversation would be easier? I think so. Is it also true that that comment really hurt her? Yes, that's also true. Both can be true at the same time. I'm learning more about my mom. I need to check my privilege. Studying is easy for me. Reading is easy for me. For a lot of people it isn't. That gave me some feedback. I was aware that we need to be inclusive for people in a wheelchair or crutches. I actually never thought about deaf people, and it only occurred to me when Hannah and I were having a conversation on Tuesday about this talk. More inclusive, because every person in this room 
has at some point in their life, and sometimes still is today, unconsciously excluding people. Because of the unawareness, because of assumed expertise, because of false empathy. And on that note, I want to finish with a poem uh, that explores that guilt. This piece is called Hashtag But Not All Men, Rape Culture. The question hits me like a sledgehammer. We're in the kitchen and my mom and sister are having a heated argument about her clothing. My sister has tied the bottom part of her shirt into a knot and now her belly is showing. My mom doesn't agree with her style and asks me, don't you want to grab a girl who is dressed like that? And for a while, the sound of my deafening silence is unbearable. I am eight years old. I can tell my mom means well, but I know the answer to that question. I know my answer to that question is no. But I don't dare to challenge my mom. I'm too scared to fight authority, so I mumble something inaudible, and they continue arguing. I don't know how it ends. I'm only eight years old. But for the first time in my life, I am complicit in rape culture. We're in the boys' dressing room of the swimming pool where we have finished our training session. The older boys are getting rowdy, and the conversation turns to sex. Whoever saw it is still a virgin, one of the oldest boys exclaims, and I stare at the floor, don't say a word, as they're making fun of all the kids who are dead silent, most of whom are still wet behind the ears, no more than 15 years young. I know they are wrong. How can you make fun of kids being virgins, and why am I the one feeling ashamed and not them? But instead of blaming them for messing with our heads, I get dressed as fast as I can, dry myself up with a towel of self-loathing, wear my shame, like clothing that fits perfectly. I'm 15 years old, and I've just learned an important lesson in the boys' dressing room. Boys will be boys. Unless you have lots of sex, then you become the man who won't be made fun of anymore. And I internalize that lesson. I'm lying in my bed with my girlfriend. We're making out. <laughs> she wants to take it further. I don't. You see, I'm still a virgin and don't feel ready yet to have sex. She insists. And for a split second, my mind is running through all the scenarios, all the options, all the choices I have in this moment, then a voice takes over. You're supposed to like it. You're supposed to like it. Dude, you're supposed to like it. You're supposed to like it. Come on, man, you're supposed to like it. And so I man up, get undressed, and we have sex. I know I should feel proud and happy in this moment, but in truth, I feel disgusted. This isn't lust, love, nor desire. We finish, I don't, she doesn't either. Neither one of us say a word. It hurts to pretend. I'm 17 years old and I have just lost my virginity, but more importantly, I have lost my innocence. I have become the embodiment of toxic masculinity. The train station is a chaos and it seems that I'll be stranded in a foreign city. My local friend lends a hand and offers to host me at her place and instantly my concerned face turns into a smile. You see, she and I, history. We arrive at her apartment, have dinner with her friends, and end up in her bed. She turns the lights off, and I put my arm around her body and try to kiss her. She pulls away, turns the lights back on, and says, why do you grab me like that in the dark? She doesn't seem angry. Rather empowered in her decision to confront me, she's not letting this one slide. I know I am guilty. I don't remember how I replied to her questions as if my mind tries to hide an ugly truth the same way society chooses to erase women's identities from our history, unimportant. We continue talking. She is teaching me an important lesson that doesn't register yet. We fall asleep in her bed the next morning after a nice breakfast. She takes me to the train station where we say goodbye. I am 24 years old and I feel more entitled to her body than she is to a no. I am 24 years old and I have become rape culture. It's a cold autumn afternoon in Amsterdam and I'm waiting at trans tram stop with a dozen or so people. A few meters away I see a young man and woman caught in what I initially thought was a romantic act of stealing kisses. But upon closer inspection you can clearly see that she is not comfortable with this aggressive demeanor and pulls away every time he goes in for a kiss, creates distance every time he pulls her towards her. But to no avail, he is just too strong, too dominant, too entitled and so fucking wrong. My first instinct is to walk over. I want to tell him, man, your arms are armed with violence. They are too dangerous to be anywhere near your girlfriend. I fear for her safety. But instead, I remain just another bystander like all the other people, all awkwardly waiting for a trend that can't arrive soon enough. 
I am 30 years old. It's six years later. And this time I am not the perpetrator, but make no mistake, I am still guilty allowing rape culture to thrive. You see, rape culture isn't about men raping. Rape culture is men justifying sexual harassment as just flirting. Rape culture is men condoning other men's oppressive behaviors. Rape culture is 30 women attempting suicide every day because of domestic violence, and every week three women escaping their abusive fate by taking their own lives. But us men, we ignore these statistics, so our count is always zero, and we can all sleep sound at night. Rape culture is a joke that isn't funny. Rape culture is one look at the news headlines. Rape culture is men not willing to look in the mirror and see the man we have become. Rape culture is silence. And while I personally don't know any known rapists, and you surely must don't know any known rapists, right? But I know men whose silence has become a minefield. And every fact, every statistic, every victim's testimony can trigger an explosion of anger. I know men whose hands have become too big for their lovers' hearts. I know men whose words have become poison, slowly silencing their lovers' voices. I know men whose sense of entitlement is bigger than the sense of responsibility. And I know men, I know myself all too well. I'm 30 years old, and I should have addressed the aggressor. I am 24 years old and I should have kept my hands to myself. I should have asked her for consent. I am 17 years old. I should have said, I don't feel ready yet to have sex. Maybe tomorrow, but not today. I am 15 years old. I should have confronted them older boys with their macho bullshit. I am eight years old. And I should have told my mother, instead of policing my sister's clothing, perhaps you should be teaching me how to behave around girls who are dressed like that. But I never said anything. I remained silent. And my silence has allowed violence of men to grow louder in volume every day. We men need to assume our responsibility. We can't stay silent. We have to speak out because while her no will always mean no, my silence will always mean yes. Thank you very much. Also, something else that works in the human psyche, and that is, um, there's this interesting thing about self-deception or self-sabotage. As long as I can, can find reason for my mom um, to behave in ways that I don't think are reasonable, I have a reason to lash out on her. It's self-deception. And so sometimes what we want is the other person to be bad, behave bad, so that we can behave bad as well. But the moment if I would apologize, and at the moment she invites me for a conversation, I have no reason to be angry anymore. There's no justification for that. So it's a combination of shame as well as self-sabotage. It's a very interesting dynamic. Um, it's something that I, I get to work with a lot when I work with my clients. I see it as being a Oh, thank you very much for the question. I think it's so important. Um, one, anger is really important in this conversation. For somebody who is oppressed, who is excluded, whether it's conscious or unconscious, anger is a normal human experience. And we should actually, the focus shouldn't be on the person not being allowed to be angry. Because then we shift the burden. Then we put the, the burden is already on the oppressed. They're being excluded. And then we put another burden on them by saying, I'm only going to listen to you if you have your emotions under control. No, the burden should be on the oppressors. We should learn to listen to anger. Um, so I would say, um, I think the focus should be on the, the oppressors. So um, men in the room, unless you have studied gender, Unless you have studied feminism, you don't know shit about sexism. Really, you don't. You don't know shit about rape culture. You don't know shit about sexual harassment. It is our responsibility as men to educate ourselves on this. It's not women's responsibility. White people, you don't know shit about racism unless you had studied racial studies. Don't put the burden on people of color. Educate yourselves. 
and learn to include emotions in the conversation because we need to learn from those emotions. Um, now, I, there's one side note to that, and that is um, when somebody starts becoming insulting, there's always space for us to say, look, I'm willing to listen to you. Um, what I'm not willing to do is, is to be insulted. Um, I'm willing to, to listen to your anger. What I'm not willing to do is, is you calling me names. Um, by the way, when you're called ignorant, that's not name calling. That's actually a fact. <laughs> Ignorance is a fact, not name, uh, name calling. Ignorance is a lack of knowledge. So put the burden on ourselves, educate ourselves, nurture our curiosity, um, and learn to include <coughs> emotions in the conversation. A great book for everyone to read, by the way, is White Fragility by Dr. Robin DiAngelo. Robin DiAngelo is a white professor who studied race for many years, who's a, co a trainer, coach, uh, around diversity and inclusion. She wrote a book, White Fragility. Um, don't focus so much on the word white. <laughs> focus on the word fragility. Fragility is basically the defensiveness, the defensiveness and the defense me mechanism, the, be the, the destructive behaviors of the oppressors every time we talk about oppression, of the oppressors. Replace white for male fragility. Replace male for able-bodied fragility, economic privilege fragi fragility. The dynamics are the same. I think it's a great starting point, White Fragility, because you start learning more about how you yourself behave in conversations about exclusion and inclusion. So this conversation has been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, we are all here because we wanted to listen to you. How can we take this conversation to the privileged? <laughs> yes. <laughs> how can we take the conversation to the privileged? Um, So I'll be honest, I don't have the right solution for that. Um, I don't have a formula that says, if this happens, then this, if that happens, then that. Um, I'm still personally exploring myself. It's a field of work that I'm, I'm currently expanding, doing workshops around diversity and inclusion, giving talks. Um, so I don't have the right answer. Um, sometimes drop, you know, kind of like dropping the bomb helps. Sometimes it's a step-by-step uh, conversation. Sometimes it's about really creating conditions so people can listen. When people are busy, this is difficult. Just simply when we are distracted, we're less curious, we're less attentive. So that's not maybe not the best time to have that conversation. Um, what I will say is discomfort is an essential part of that conversation. Discomfort is an essential part of the conversation. So the moment it gets uncomfortable, that doesn't mean you should stop. It means that we're only at the, at the verge of really exploring the subject of inclusiveness and exclusion. How do you stop stereotyping? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> Here, here's, here's what I think is, is interesting about stereotyping is um, we're human beings. Unless somebody now wants to stand up and say, I'm AI, I'm a robot, <laughs> I, I admit. We, we are humans, and, and part of the human experience is to be subjective. It is literally humanly impossible to be objective. There will always be an emotional connection to whatever it is that we're doing. It is impossible to be objective, so accept the fact that we are subjective. We will stereotype. So the, 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 uh, for me, the, the focus isn't about the stereotyping, for me the focus is about are you are you acknowledging the ignorance and educating yourself? So the impact of the stereotyping becomes less and less and less. Uh, I don't know what to look. <laughs> Go, go, go. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, I keep coming back to that moment on the train platform um, in, your, in your spoken word performance um, and was wondering if there were any insights from your work in behavior change science that would have made, kind of impacted the way you would have confronted the, uh, the couple um, in a way that would have 
made your message land better or, you know, because there's like the one side that's calling him out and kind of confronting the situation. There's another that's using kind of these insights about how people receive information. And so I'm curious if on reflection yeah. there's anything. Like how do you intervene when you see moments of oppression, exclusion? Um, Focus a moment on the, the person that you co don't control. The person you don't control is the oppressor. You, you never know how they're gonna behave. You can say one thing and they lash out. You can say another thing and they, you can say the same thing and, and the person doesn't really lash out. So the one thing we don't know is how will the, the oppressor respond? Um, so I can't tell you do this, do that. There are, by the way, resources about that. Uh, for example, uh, nonviolent in intervention when you see racism or sexism happening on public transport. But I think one of the things is, um, one, who do you focus on? Do you focus on the oppressed or do you focus on the oppressed? Uh, that can be a major difference maker. So do you, do you go up to the, to the guy on the platform or do you actually step in and, and ask the woman uh, if she's okay or you can even ask them about, hey, do you know the time, or you know something else that that interrupts the dynamic itself, without particularly addressing a particular person. I think the the thing that we want to do, regardless of how you do it, is we want to disrupt the in, the dynamic, disrupt the dynamic, so that the dynamic itself doesn't continue. That can be done in many different ways. I can't tell you what way is the right way in what situation per se. Again, something I'm still also learning more about. Um, but hopefully, like if you think about, you want to disrupt the dynamic uh, in that very moment. Final question. Uh, when you deal with race-based microaggressions or just the general feeling of being excluded, how do you deal with white people who say, oh, you're just imagining things. That's not true. You're being mm. oversensitive. <laughs> 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 think about all the times that has happened <laughs> just recently a couple of days ago online on my Facebook wall um, things exploded a bit um, so I can only say what I do right now I think that's the, the most sort of honest thing that I can say one I have a couple of different strategies for that one I educate I take the time to explain things, to um, to not talk about my emotions per se, but to talk about the systems of oppression, to talk about the dynamics. Um, if they don't want to listen to that, bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is sometimes um, uh, I call them out. One of the things that I've learned, that I had to learn, is that fuck you is a totally legitimate an okay and full response <laughs> to certain situations. Um, it is. I don't want to sound sex. Fuck you. <laughs> I had to learn that fuck you is an adequate response in certain situations because it's also about self-protection. It's not about the well-being of the other person. And by the way, I'm not calling you names. I'm just saying fuck you. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things that I do, and I've, I've chosen that, and I think that's a choice everyone <coughs> needs to make, because the burden is on the oppressors, not the oppressed. But one of the choices that I've made is I want to educate. That's a choice I've made. So I write poetry. Um, most of my poetry is, is socially critical, political. And I write poetry uh, in order to educate. Um, I think we have to make that choice. But for the oppressed, if you're part of the oppressed group, self-protection. Self-protection is so, so important, so that tomorrow you feel better again and you can do whatever it means to you, or even a few minutes later. I'd say thank you very much to Creative Mornings, the, the whole team, for, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, I've had a blast, and uh, I would say if you don't have to rush, stick around and continue the conversation. Thank you, Kevin.